Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel with a program which, as you know, is devoted to painting and drawing from life. However, sometimes we can't get out in life, and so I'm using the wonderful uh, electronic device of uh, doing a videotape and working from that. And when you see my videotapes of the scenes, you'll realize that they are not still pictures, that they are actual out there on the, say, on the scene uh, shooting it live. And if something flies by or runs by or cars drive by, then you know that I'm looking at a live scene. About the closest you can get to being out there. And this program is going to be um, uh, visiting and painting and interpreting uh, a really extraordinary place here on the island on the south shore in the Robert Moses uh, State Park with a view of the what is called the water tower. I uh, really don't know whether it has water in it or not but anybody who knows the area knows that it's called the Robert Moses water tower. It's uh, uh, east of uh, Jones Beach and uh, west, I believe, of Smith Point Beach, which means that somewhere along this wonderful coastline, uh, there is this area. It's, um, it's quite wonderful because it's still wild. I have to admit that we walked on these dunes to take these pictures, and I think that that probably is not a good idea. However, uh, when the uh, crowds come, uh, great fences are put up and the public is requested to not walk along the dunes. Um, there is really quite nothing as, uh, as uh, mystifying and as exciting, I think, as the beach, no matter what time of year, no matter what sort of day it is, the beach is the greatest place, I suppose, in the world. And here is a uh, sample of the wildness that we can find right here amidst our... Um, our malls and shopping centers and electronic wonders that we have is a wild place. And um, the foreground is the most important part of this painting because it occupies most of the space. I'm working on a, uh, on a perfectly white, unprepared canvas at this point because I have to work with all sorts of materials to tell you what is possible and what isn't. Uh, the laying this out, is, I'm going to show you, is merely a question of laying out the general uh, forms of what Long Island has to settle for of mountains. There is no such thing here as mountains. But these dunes are very close to just miniatures, mi Miniaturized mountains, and when you um, when you see the uh, what the winter will do to dunes and what the summer will do, what the public will do to dunes, you realize that they are fragile as well as being very wild, and that doesn't seem to go together. That something that is wild is fragile, but it does go together. And uh, this area here is um, is a uh, it, well, it's a national tre a national treasure. We all know that, and the Atlantic Ocean is always the most intriguing, one of the most intriguing oceans in the world, I suppose. I've seen the Pacific, and I've flown across the. Pacific, but I find that the Atlantic is probably the most, the most friendly to me and the most intriguing. This is a layout with very few lines. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a sort of a single broken line. There's another one diagonal, and then there's the one of the horizon. You can't get much simpler than that, but it does tell you uh, that we are on this planet and that this is an actual possible place. The only thing that is going to make it identifiable is 
this tower, this water tower, which peeks out from uh, from the left side of the canvas, and it's uh, it's kind of mauve in color. It's uh, a, a very tall tower, and it um, it uh, dominates the parking uh, circle there at the end of the Robert Moses Causeway. Uh, it has an identifiable shape to it. It looks a little bit like a um, like a European or a via, uh, a little um, a minaret or um, one of those wonderful little towers in Venice. But uh, if it's properly done, it will be identifiable, and people who know it will be able to say, "Oh, that's the so and so." So uh, this is the probably the simplest uh, composition you can imagine, that just with three lines and one vertical. However, we have to try and pull it off. There is a hill that comes down here on which grass is growing. There is another clump that takes place here and continues to the right side of the picture. And then there are some wonderful things to interpret in the foreground of these blowing uh, beach grass. My botanist friend Michael said that it is called beach grass when I asked him if there was anything more than that. So thanks to the wonderful scientific rendering of that, we have beach grass in the foreground. Uh, however, I didn't know what it was called. I know that it's not Spartina grass, which is what grows in the creeks here on Long Island. So there is probably a wonderful Latin term for this, which we don't know. Anyway, when somebody calls, I'm sure that the public, if they have any, uh, any uh, desire to let me know what it is, they'll call. All right, I'm doing uh, another thing which I uh, talk about very often. I am mixing my color right on this canvas. Many reasons, and I tell you why every time I do it, that you try to take along as little as possible on painting trips. You do not go and try to take the entire studio. And a palette turns, turns out to be, it just gets in the way. Uh, you don't have to, you can mix it on the palette. If you need to have a place to mix more complicated colors, you do it down at the lower left or right hand corner. And then when the time comes, you scrape it off, blend it all in, and you have uh, managed to eliminate the need to, to uh, as the uh, slang term says, schlep uh, a whole bunch of unnecessary equipment. Here is my, uh, my brand new wonderful palette knife that cost, let me see, oh, uh, 469, uh, made in Japan. It's great. You can buy Italian ones for twice that much or three times that much. But um, I bought this at Pearl Paint in New York on Canal Street and it's a lovely, uh, perfectly serviceable palette knife. And I talk about this not because I'm uh, that conscious of price, but I'm conscious of the fact that people wonder uh, what these supplies cost. And that uh, there are so many programs that sell the product of the painter. And of course, uh, most of the time, those prices are terribly inflated and they ought to, um, and the uh, buyer beware. There is no need to spend enormous amounts of uh, extra dollars on, on products that are virtually the same as the ones that can be bought by uh, perfectly reputable art supply companies for one half. I kid you not, one half of what the prices are that are quoted on the programs that sell their own paint. I will give you a specific example. A tube of this um, quick drying white cells in the uh, neighborhood um, uh, art shops for eight and a half or nine dollars a tube. At Pearl Paint, I pay six. $6.30 a tube, and the programs that sell their own paint sells a tube of white paint that size for $15. So I do believe that um, um, the, uh, the need to pay attention to what you're, what you're buying and what you're getting involved in when you, uh, when you think that uh, you need to buy the, um, the sets and kits uh, that go uh, from other programs, uh, the, uh, it is not, it is not Functionable, nor is it necessary. So if you want any information about buying supplies that you can afford, uh, write to me here at the um, station and I'll send you a prepared sheet of uh, what you, where you should go and approximately what you should pay and approximately what you should be aware of, uh, beware of uh, uh, be on the lookout for, namely, uh, namely rip-off deals, which are... Um, in my opinion, immoral. Anyway, here we go. Here, while I was telling you all about the horrors of um, art supplies, uh, I've painted a sky for you. This was a virtually cloudless sky when this was done. The wind was up, but there were no clouds. And um, 
Uh, the, uh, the winter is not yet gone, but the colors are still beautifully muted as they are in the winter time. And this, this is the kind of uh, color scheme that I'm, I'm extremely fond of. So back to the wonderful ocean called Atlantic, one of my favorite oceans. I do not know what the Indian Ocean is like, but I do know what the Pacific Ocean is like, and I know what the Mediterranean Sea is like. And they're all perfectly acceptable, but they're not quite as, um, as close to me. I kind of bonded to the Atlantic Ocean. I find something about it which is extremely, well, bonding. And um, I have lived near it uh, for long enough to probably feel that way. And its color in the wintertime is very different than what it is in the summer. There's a slight touch of mauve to it. And um, the reason that I'm taking so, so long uh, mixing it is because being uh, absolutely uh, nitpicking on the accuracy of color, I want to make sure that it's, um, it's the right one. Because in the summertime, the color of this water from this particular area, the southern part of uh, Long Island, the south shore of Long Island, is different than what it is in the wintertime. In the winter, and there were some people out there during this blustery, windy day when this scene was shot, and they were out there having the best time. Uh, somebody had a, um, a metal detector uh, looking for, oh, I suppose, Spanish doubloons. I have no idea. Maybe lost, uh, lost diamond rings, or maybe even just um, uh, anything else that uh, that you happen to find. Beachcombers uh, many times are not fussy. Uh, whatever they turn up with, they're perfectly happy with. And here were some people out there with a metal detector on this blustery cold day. And, uh, and then, of course, the seagulls were out, and the walkers, and the people, the children. And um, so it doesn't seem to matter what the general uh, uh, atmosphere is like, the beach is calling. The beach calls. And here, with my palette knife, I'm going to play a very powerful role. role. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to put waves in the Atlantic Ocean. And if you, if you talk about power, I think that's probably the ultimate. Here I am putting a breaking wave right there in the distance. Hopefully it, um, it's convincing. Yeah, it looks pretty good. And here's another one breaking over here. Uh, I'm going to slap onto the smash onto the beach. And here are a few little ones that are finding um, trouble landing because there is some obstruction, namely a rise in the beach. Anyway, the beach was quite wonderful, and something very strange was happening out there. Since the storms of the winter time, something has been churned up from the bottom, and the beach is literally grayish mauve. It is a strange dark color, not beach color like we're used to, but it is a mauvish tone. And I brought some of the some of it with me. Uh, so after the break, I'll be sure to show you some of the mauvish um, color that I bought from brought up from the beach just to show you what was happening out there because I know that more than likely you will not follow my advice and go out and see the beach. And so I have to tell you about it. And I did bring you some of the sand that has been uh, uh, um, washed up on the shore. I don't know where it came from, and I certainly would be happy for anybody to tell me, but there is a touch of mauve up towards the land uh, on that sand, which looks very much like it might be um, uh, pumice or mica or something. But anyway, it's, it, 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 it runs along the, uh, run, run, runs along the, um, the dunes. Uh, the, uh, the part of the beach near the water is still beach color, but the part near the dunes is literally mauve. And um, uh, so, so, you know, so I'm telling you. The, the, the thing that you see on the, on the monitor there is the part near the water. That hasn't turned dark. Uh, that's not the dark stuff, but it's, it's worth a trip. It's worth a trip to go on down there. Now I'm going to um, put in before it's um, before I start working on the foreground, because the foreground is what can make or break this kind of a painting. I'm going to put the water tower in that I talked about. It's a little bit diffused. It's um, it needs to be the right color, and that may be a little bit too dark. As you notice, I'm putting it on with a brush because I want to be absolutely accurate with. It. I think there's a little bit more red in it than that. So um, uh, we fortunately do take close-ups when we are out there. Yes, it's a, it's a brick. It's obviously brick, and it's, uh, it's got a, a brick tone to it. With the atmosphere, it seems to turn somewhat mauve in color or purple. And um, then it has, the, uh, it has a nice design, the uh, designers. And I was talking about architecture on one of my previous shows, about how architecture seems to have taken a holiday with all these really, really 
ugly malls that are being put up all over this lovely island and somehow somewhere along the line we've got to we've got to figure out some way to stop that i mean there is a there is a, a shopping mall uh on the way to uh, robert moses parkway uh, and it's got sterns and sears and and all sorts of other things and uh it's just it's just really not attractive i mean it's actually downright ugly and we've got to try and figure out some way to stop that from from just going any further i mean we do not need to to surround ourselves with these with these uh, sites that are not pleasant to live with certainly we can we can uh, design things that are going to be historically pres worth preserving historically you cannot tell me that some of these shopping malls are going to be worth preserving historically at any time or for any reason it's um the the, the sooner that they are condemned and collapsed the better and uh, <laughs> I don't live here anymore that's why I apparently can take the chances of saying these things here is this here are the nice wonderful verticals of this uh, uh, design which uh, has a uh, which has some uh, when you go and look at it sometime you'll see that it's very identifiable usually lighthouses or whatever the they are don't have um, verticals they have uh, uh, horizontal stripes for ships to be able to see them but this one is not uh, acting the role of a lighthouse it's acting the role of a uh, of whatever it is it's if it's a beacon or if it's a water tower i'm not sure but anyway it's um it's a nice piece and the top uh, is probably lighter than what it is but i'm gonna i'll, I'll work on that later as soon as i see it uh, the light is catching the top of it and it must have some sort of metallic roof on it which makes it lighter in places so but it is um, it is identifiable uh, by its um, uh, vertical lines. Let me see if I can get that thing to shine up there. Um, no, I will, I'll do it later when my brush is cleaner and I and I take a break and get a clean brush and so on. But the uh, this this tower up here has got to be accurate so that we know exactly where we are. And um, there, here we are, some light. Maybe this maybe this will make it shine somewhat. All right, um, the uh, the. Um, the summertime uh, is, of course, when uh, crowds of enormous quantities <laughs> of, uh, get in their cars and tie up the, 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 the parkways and make life generally uh, very trying. But this is why they come. They come to this beach. And uh, it's to be preserved, of course, at all costs. And I think that when you do go out there at any time, you'll realize that this is a gift. Uh, the, fortunately, we do have these parks uh, and that you can turn your back on the really unfortunate um, uh, architecture uh, that you see just on the mainland. This is a, a spit of land. Well, I'm going to have to work on that later. Um, the uh, oh, there are those little strange uh, light dots in there. I don't know what they are, but I'm going to put them in right now before they before they go away. There are little little dots that are on the perimeter of this. And I don't know what they are, but they certainly have to be in there. And then there's a light part here. So uh, now we have the foreground, the uh, enormous problem of the foreground. The foreground, of course, is uh, a dune. And it needs to be, I need to be able to uh, actually make you believe that what I'm doing here is going to be a dune. Uh, while I'm mixing all this and getting some of, these, um, some of these brushes a little bit cleaner and to work on my tower, I'm going to take a break for just a moment. So I'll be right back.
Yes, yeah, so well, here we are back again, and as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the sand uh, has turned sort of dark and mauve and has churned something up, and I brought some back. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I'm not sure that you can see it carefully, but you can see how much darkness there is in that. It's not really what I call uh, summer sand color. And this is what's been dredged up. Uh, it's still got that lovely texture that sand does. It sort of moves on its own. But the, this is what's out there at the um, Robert Moses State Park. And if you, uh, if you wanted to do with you, if you wonder what to do with your time, just go on out and take a look at that sand. It'll be there for a while. And uh, I think that it may be the result of this uh, rather what I call a difficult winter. And so there, there you have it. I, I kind of, um, I always bring something back and I would much rather have a pile of sand than a souvenir bought in a shop with a label on it. Anyway, here we have the need to do the dunes. Now the dunes are um, notoriously pale and therefore they have to, you have to keep that in mind that they are, uh, uh, the, this dark sand has not found its way up to these dunes. The point of the dunes is that, um, and there are an awful lot of paintings around of dunes which really don't work very well because you can't just, you can't just put uh, sand color on something and then uh, throw a, a little bit of beach grass growing out of it and expect people to believe that it is actually a dune. It is quite complicated to do because it's an illusion. Uh, the dune is there, but what happens to it is there's a, there's a great deal of, um, of illusionary thing because the light plays such strange tricks on sand and on the depressions of sand. So uh, the foreground, the fact that this foreground here is almost all dune um, will not only uh, arouse uh, memories of when you've walked on dunes, but it'll also maybe um, point out some of the things about them which are so unique to dunes, especially the Long Island dunes. Now there are dunes in other parts. There is a a rather amazing set of dunes in um, in the west, uh, and then there are the creeping dunes in uh, Arizona and Nevada and Colorado and so on. And those sands are all sand, but they are not like these. They are simply different. Uh, whatever it is that makes them what they are, uh, I am. I'm. That is not my. That's not my. Um, my métier, but it certainly is a, an interesting uh, phenomenon to think that um, just because it's sand that it's all the same. Actually, it is not. It's what grows on them and what does not grow on them and what the wind does to them. So um, the, uh, the need to shade them and to treat them like uh, other mountains is essential and uh, they do have their shadowy side and here on this side the, uh, this dune has got something of a, of a shadow because the, uh, the, light is, uh, the light is causing one side of it to be lit and therefore um, this, there, there, is a, there is a dark area. There's a lot of interpretation that has to be done with this kind of painting and there is the evidence of some of this dark and mauve sand that I have just put on the table here. I do see that it, is, it has found its way up here. Um, uh, uh, probably blown, uh, and that there are uh, that there are uh, deposits of it here and there, but um, it, it's um, it's uh, it's a part of the landscape which I find uh, quite mysterious and um, certainly worth recording. Uh, beach paintings. Uh, some most of the time in my opinion don't work very well i don't know why they don't because probably because they're so hard to do uh, and um, i have been painting them for a long time and find something new every time i tackle one of them so as you can see as i'm as i'm press spreading these colors naturally this is the introduction uh, this is the background for the um, painting of the uh, grasses in the summer in a matter of a few months all of these grasses which which are appearing here today in orange and ochre and amber and sometimes even in brown are seasonal colors of course and that's why I like to be able to uh, cover all seasons. Uh, certainly uh, most painters believe that the weather has to be absolutely postcard right in order to go out and paint and in my opinion uh, they should be uh, uh, not postcard right at all. They should be either very disturbed or extremely uh, unusual looking. So 
uh, with some orange and a touch of um, and a touch of uh, the green that I mixed up before. I'm going to start to uh, work on the um, on the. Uh, grasses and the growths on this particular uh, beach. Now, off in the distance, you'll see that this rise here has got some dark areas, uh, probably concentra a, a concentration of the grasses that are growing up on the surface of that, of that little uh, mound here. It's, um, uh, they, uh, sometimes they grow heavier in, in, in places, and sometimes they, they are, um, they are uh, 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 larger plants, uh, but, uh, but uh, they are outlining the top of this, well, it's sort of a bluff. It's actually not a bluff. It is a wind-blown section of this beach. There is some green in it uh, because the green is, uh, is, a pr is a very persistent color in uh, foliage. No matter what the weather does, some foliage is going to remain green. But there is a there is an, a general outline to some of these um, to some of these dunes. And then, of course, there is the need to um, make them extremely scumbly. Uh, I've just gotten a signal. Maybe we're going to have to break in a little while. But I like to get just a little bit of the scumble on top of this on top of this um, dune here, and I'm going to apply the color, and then I'm going to uh, scumble it with another brush. And by scumbling, it's a, it is a technique which you have to learn how to do if you're going to be doing landscape. And here, I'm going to do it with this brush. You, 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 you paint something in, and then you completely ruin it. You take it off entirely. But it gives the effect that you want, namely, nothing, nothing definite. It's so difficult to paint things that aren't definite. So uh, th this, is a, this is a style and a technique which you have to try to develop. I've developed my own. Other people develop their own. But there is a pattern, random as it may seem, to these grasses. And uh, that's what is going to make this painting recognizable as being that particular part of the world, the fact that these grasses do this. I hope that people will uh, go on out there. It is, uh, it is free. You do not have to pay a dime to get into this place. You can go at any time that you want to and um, just uh, stand and wonder at it. Really, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something in your own backyard. I know that people call up the travel agent and spend thousands of dollars and book passages all over the world, and uh, the uh, <laughs> the interesting thing is that it's all right here. Uh, ha actually, because uh, human beings are so restless, there are people in Greece that call their travel agents and ask to be booked passage to Long Island. So, so be it. Uh, that's that's the perversity of uh, what we call us. I'm going to break now for just a minute. Don't go too far away, but I'll be right back.